Greetings from Minister Maker Ministries. I'm Dr. Gary Linton, and we're ready in our study of James for James chapter 3, verses 2 through 12, dealing with the tongue. Probably not a popular subject. Most of the problems that I hear about in churches and among God's people is not with, about carousing, is not about all the flagrant sins that we hear about in the world. But typically, and most generally, it's about the tongue. The unbridled tongue is what James is dealing with. We tear down rather than build up. We cause discord rather than unity through our tongue. It destroys all too frequently a destructive force within the body of Christ. We always see it in the world, but it's manifest very deadly in the body of Christ. Most complaints that I hear of people about the church is because of people's unbridled tongue. God help us. We want to label all these other sins as just, oh, how horrific they are. But I, I'm convinced, and I think James is convinced, that one of the most deadly sins is our tongue. The unbridled tongue. The tongue that is out of control. We, we devastate people with our with our mouths we don't have any control over our over the words of our mouth what our tongue brings forth and i really think james is giving a very strong rebuke in our passage today concerning the tongue in the believer's life it must be brought back under control. I heard a couple quotes from Dr. J. Vernon McGee, who's since passed away, but uh, he said, in Balaam's day, it's a, it was a miracle for an ass to speak. Today, it's a miracle of an ass keeps quiet. <laughs> it takes a baby two years to learn to talk and 50 years to learn to keep quiet. <laughs> how true that is we just can't keep quiet and I'm, I'm going by memory here I don't have it memorized but I, but but I think Ecclesiastes 5 2 about as I recall said the the wise man says the preacher says let thy words be few but we just let it keep spewing out our words keep spewing out and out out flowing out of our tongue the unbridled tongue the tongue is a badge we wear it and it identifies us it's the table of contents of our lives our tongue gives us away it tells who we are <laughs> they, they were said of peter when, when he was at the enemy's camp when jesus was being had been arrested and he was warming himself by the fire. And they said, surely you are one of them. <laughs> and, and he said, no. And he denied the Lord, just like Jesus said. And he says, yes, you are. Thy speech betrayeth thee. <laughs> You're a Galilean. You got to be. You got to be one of those Galileans. Your speech betrays you. How often does our speech betray us? Someone, someone, someone said this, Thou art master of, of the unspoken word, but the spoken word is master of you. Once we've said something, it's, out, it, it's, it's beyond our control. We can't do anything about it. If you haven't spoken it, you can't be responsible. But, but once you've spoken it, it condemns us and destroys others. There's, there's two passages in Proverbs. Proverbs 64, 3 says, Thy, They sharpen their tongues like swords, 
and aim cruel words like deadly arrows. Oh, how true that is. Aim cruel words like deadly arrows. Psalm 64, 3, Psalm 6, or, or Proverbs 64, 3, Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Oh God, let, our, let, let wise words flow from our tongue to bring healing, not reckless words that pierce like swords. Let me deal with, first of all, the offensive tongue. Verse James 3, 2. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not, not in word, the same as a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. So talking about offensive words. And I think it brings us into the context of what we did on our, our last study about teachers of the word. My brethren, be not many teachers, masters, teachers, knowing that we shall receive the greater judgment. For in many things, verse 2, we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is the perfect word, a perfect man able also to bridle the whole body. Deal with teachers. Teachers, it's important what you say. What you say carries great, great weight and gravity to it. Your words do matter. What you teach matters. That's why it's important that you speak. 2 Timothy 1.13 says, we are to hold fast the form of sound words. Let us hold fast the form of sound words. Let's make sure we're teaching the word accurately. But I think it also deals with, as we ended our study last week, offensive words. Faith, the, the word will offend at times. But oftentimes we offend with the words of our mouth that flow from our tongues from things that don't matter. We want to hold a position on some in, in some area. And we hold our ground. And we offend with many words. And we lose good people and cut off the opportunity to con of continued ministry in their lives. Because we've offended them in word. If any man offend not in word, the same as a perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. We offend. And oftentimes they leave the church or they get out from under our teaching. And then because of their the offense and their hurt and sometimes bitterness, they begin to talk around the community. And we also cut off ministry ministry to those to, that, that could have been could have come under our teaching, but will not because of the words that these people have spoken. We brought offense from over things that, something that doesn't really matter. We do need to hold firm the word of God. Stand firm. Never compromise the word, no matter who gets offended. But let's not offend in areas that are non-essential. Things that, often we are in things that don't matter. But this also deals with the body of Christ as a whole. Believers within the church. Every born-again believer and it can also, we can apply this to the world too, but, but we're dealing with the church. James is writing to, the, to saints, who, born again believers who have been scattered abroad. Words flowing from our tongues, tongue often come, cause irreparable dam damage. We say things that hurt, bring division, pierce people's hearts like daggers, and cause conflict rather than peace. God help us. We need to bring our tongue under control and stop causing offense with our tongues on things that really don't matter, things that tear down rather than build up. That's why Paul said, let, her, let, let no corrupt, he wasn't talking about cursing, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, 
that it may minister grace, favor to the hearer. The corrupt words are words that tear down rather than edify and build up. If any man offend not in word, the same as the perfect man, able also to bridle the whole body. Hallelujah. A perfect or mature man. Maturity is the goal. And one of the biggest signs of maturity is if we're, when we're able to bring our tongue under control, letting our words be few, not speaking offensive words, but speaking words rather that build up, not tear down, words that edify, words that bring unity and not discord, that bring encouragement and not despair and discouragement. We need to bring our words under control. It's a perfect man. That's the goal, maturity, till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect, mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. That's God's goal. He's destined us to be conformed to the image of his son. Paul, writing to the Galatians, in Galatians 4, 19, he says, My little children, of whom I travail in birth again until Christ be formed in you, Galatians 4, 19. The writer of Hebrews, therefore leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us press on unto maturity, Pressing on unto maturity. Let's press on unto maturity. And one of the biggest signs and badges of our maturity is whether we're able to bridle our tongue or not. Offensive words. Then James 3, 3 and 4 deal with bridled or restrained or con and controlled guidance. Behold, we put bits in horses' mouths, and they obey us, and we turn about their whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth, or the pilot directs it. Controlled guidance. Restrained. Are we able to restrain the tongue? Are we able to control it and guide it? properly so that it goes the direction and accomplishes the person the, the purpose for, for that we desire or does it bring destruction often our, 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 what comes out of our mouth what flows from our tongues our word it, it, it's more like a uh, instead of the bit in the horse's mouth and controlling it and directing the horse properly Often it's like a horse that's been spooked and it's bucking and out of control or like a ship in a mighty storm. And that storm is just tossing the ship here and there. With his passengers fearing for their very lives. We need to bridle our tongue. Hear me. If we could ever bring the tongue under control, we would direct the entire course of our life. It would change the direction of your life. What you say does matter. I have never been a part of the Word of Faith movement, nor do I agree with many of their extremes. But they do, the, we can't throw the truth out that they have, though. Our words do matter. What we say can direct the entire course of our life. Like the rudder directing the, sh the, the ship, this mighty, though they be so great, yet yeah, they've driven about with a very, turned about with a very small hymn. They're driven to fierce winds. Yet that very small helm can direct the, 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 the ship to go in the direction the pilot desires it to be. The ship captain directs it, is directing it. 
and cause it to go exactly where they want. The horse's bridle causes the horse to go exactly where the rider wants because they're directing it. If we could direct the words of our mouth and cause and begin to cause what we say to be that which is uplifting, that which is faith-filled, not unbelief, but faith-filled. Speak, often we're speaking words of unbelief instead of words of faith. We're speaking words that cause damage rather than build up. We're speaking words that bring hurt rather than healing. Let's bring it under control like the bit in the horse's mouth or like the rudder of a mighty ship that's driven to fierce winds and is turned about with a very small helm whithersoever the governor listeth or directs it. Oh, if we could ever do that, the our tongue could direct or redirect. Some of you have been going through some times and difficulty, and I really feel like the Lord's want, speaking to you today and telling you, you can begin by the, what you say, direct the entire, redirect the entire course of your life. No, it won't happen overnight. But as you begin to reform the words and begin to hold fast this form of sound words, it can begin to redirect the course you're on. Many of us, because of the things we said, we've said, we're like that spooked horse, or the ship in a in a mighty storm or hurricane that's out of control. Well, if we could ever bring it in control, church, restrain their controlled guidance, then he deals with the destructiveness of the tongue. James three five and six. Even so, the tongue is a little. So he talk, the, the, what it controls is the destructiveness, what he goes on to, to say. Even so, the tongue is a little member, little tiny member like the rudder or the bit, and boasteth great things. Behold how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members that it defileth the whole body. And setteth on fire the course of nature, and it set on fire of hell itself. Oh, the destructiveness of the tongue. It sets on fire the course of nature, and it set on fire of hell itself. I think showing somewhat of its source. Notice it says, it def James 3, 5, and 6, it defiles the whole body. Now, James using that from verse 2, you can control the whole body, but let me tell you, if any man be a perfect man, he's able to control the whole body by what he says. Now, I think that can apply to the body of Christ. In verse 6 there it says, it defiles the whole body. How often I've seen the tongue destroy a body of believers and if not completely destroy it, bring irreparable damage that it takes years and sometimes decades to overcome because people's tongues have been out of control. Gossip. <laughs> Just start, we start telling things we hear and just spreading things. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Did you hear about this? Or oh, I heard so-and-so was struggling in this. That's never God. Proverbs 17, 9, He that covers a transgress, transgression seeks love, but he that repeats a matter separates very thick friends. I'm reminded of Genesis 9, 23. Noah, after, he, after the flood, they, would, they got back on dry ground again. The waters abated and he planted a vineyard, made him some, some, some wine, got drunk. 
He got dog drunk so much that he passed out in his tent, stark naked. And Ham saw him, one of his sons. He came, he came and he said, to his other brothers, Shem and Japheth, and said, come see the old man, Mr. Spiritual, Mr. Preacher of Righteousness. He's passed out in the tent. Not a stitch of clothes on. He was blabbing, gossiping. Instead of covering, Shem and Japheth went to the tent grabbed a blanket or some kind of covering, put it on their shoulders and walked backwards so that they would not even look on their father's nakedness and covered him. They covered the transgression. After Noah had awakened, he blessed. There was a blessing upon Shem and Japheth and a curse upon Ham. How often we brought a curse upon our lives by spreading things, spreading rumors. Then there's criticism. We're critiquing everything, criticizing every nit lit biggie thing that happens in the church or criticizing things in people's lives that's really simply none of our business. Paul to, Paul's told to the, talking to the Romans, who are thou the judges and another man's servant, to his own mastery stands or falls. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. Romans 4.14, 4, verse 10, or 14.4, 4, 14.10, But why dost thou judge thy brother, or why dost thou bring it not thy brother? For we shall all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Verse 14.19, let us therefore follow hard after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. James or Romans 14, 19. Later on, we're going to see in chapter 4, verse 11 of James, speak not evil one of another, brethren. He that speaketh evil of his brother and judges his brother, speaketh evil of the law and judges the law. But if thou judge the law, thou art not a doer of the law, but a judge. Let's stop criticizing and judging one another and tend to our own affairs. Judge not, Jesus said, that you be not judged for what measure you judge, it shall be measured to you again. Why beholdest thou the, the, the speck that is in your brother's eye and behold not the mote that is in your own? Matthew 7, 1 and 2. Then bitterness, much of this flows from bitterness. Hebrews 12, 15 says, and, and, and that bitterness flows up out of our heart through our tongue and is deadly. Looking diligently as any man fell of the grace of God lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. It defiles us and many. Those we're speaking about, those we're talking about, those we're bitter against, and those are just around us, hearing us, the bitterness flow from our tongue. Paul gives 14 indictments against mankind in Romans 3. But I want you to notice, notice what comes from the tongue as we proceed in this. As Romans 3, 10 through 18. But as is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth, there's none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they've used deceit. The poison of asp is under their licks, lips. Destruction and misery are in their ways and the way of peace have they not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Notice verse 13. Their throat is an open 
sepulcher with their tongues they've used to see the poison of asps under the lips. Bitterness flowing from our tongues. That's why Paul warned against us. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speak and be put away from you with all malice. And be ye kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. It's the destructiveness of the tongue. Let me add two things with this too. In the context, this also deals with teaching. Make sure what's coming out of our mouth and our teaching is building up, not tearing down. Make sure we're rightly divide, you're rightly dividing the word of truth. Make sure you're holding fast the form of sound words. But thou speak the things which become sound doctrine. Hebrews 13.9 says, be not carried away with varied and strange doctrines. We need to get stop speaking words that propagate error and make sure we're speaking the truth. Thus saith the Lord, teaching the word of God. That's why systematically teaching through a book of the Bible is good. It keeps you on target, but you have, it's harder because you have to put a lot of study into it. Those of you pastors and teachers, I'm do, I've done much of the study for you from the James. You can take this and, and just uh, the outline's there for you on our, on our website. But teaching the form, what we teach matters. It also can deal with counseling. Proverbs 18, 13, he that answers the matter before he hears it, it is folly and shame unto him. That's why James said in verse 19, Wherefore let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak. Listen carefully. Make sure you know what the problem is and you've evaluated it thor thoroughly before you begin giving advice, even from the Word. Sometimes we can give wrong scriptures because we've not thoroughly listened to what the person's going through and thoroughly understood, understanding it. Then verses 7 and 8, James deals with the untamed tongue. For every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tamed and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame. It is an unruly evil full of deadly poison. Every, all kinds of animals have been tamed, but the tongue can no man tame. It's uncontrollable. Sometimes we just can't shut up. Again, I repeat, Romans 3.13, it applies so greatly here. Their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they've used to seek. The poison of asp is under their lips. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. I took it on through 15. Verse 15. Then the double-minded tongue, or the double tongue, James 3, 9 and 10, Therewith bless we God, even the Father, and therewith curse we men, which are made in the similitude or likeness of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessing and cursing. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. The double tongue. We talk out of both sides of our mouth. At one minute, we're just blessing God and worshiping and praising the name of the Lord. Glory be to God. And the next minute, we're beating our brother and we're piercing their hearts and we're to bring destruction to our brothers and sisters in Christ by what we say. I want to repeat Proverbs 64, 3. They sharpen their tongues like swords. And aim cruel words like deadly arrows. Proverbs 12, 18. They're, the words of the reckless, the reckless pierce like swords. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. We talk out of both sides. Of we can... We, he says, these things ought not to be. You're worshiping God and then tearing down someone. Stop it. 
Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned and avoid them. Number 16, 17. You can stop it before it comes to fruition and becomes like a deadly fire going through the body of Christ and defiles the whole body and sets on fire the course of nature within that body of believers. Then notice the source. James 3, 11, 12. Does the fountain send forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fountain can the bring forth sweet water and bitter? Does the, does the fountain bring forth at the same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries, either of vine figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. He's dealing with the source. Where's these things? Where does it come from? He's, it's coming from the heart. That's why Jeremiah said, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Who can know the depths of its depravity? Again, Romans 3.13, their throat is an open sepulcher with their tongues they've used to see that the poison of asp is under their lips. It flows from the, that deadly stench of a tomb inside of us, flowing out of us. That's why Jesus said, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth that which is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth that which is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. It comes from the heart. That's why we need to crucify it. Crucify ourselves. Bring it to the cross. Likewise, reckon you also yourselves be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal bodies that you shall obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, weapons of righteousness unto God. The tongue, that member, let it be yielded to God as weapons of righteousness, not a weapon of destruction and mayhem. Take it to the cross. Then we need to remove new our mind and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Changing what's flowing, what our heart is being filled with. Getting into the word. Filling yourself with the things of God. Then let the spirit of God begin to fill you. Speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving you know, speaking to one another, yourselves, one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, those things that lift up Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let me close it by, by six brief applications. Dealing with the power of the tongue. There's power in the tongue to justify or condemn. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof on the day of judgment. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Matthew 12, 36 and 37. That's why Paul said that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It does matter what we say and one day we'll give an account. They, our words will either justify us or condemn us. And often in this life, they'll either judge us or condemn us by what we say. Then death and life. Our tongues can produce death or life in our own life and those around us. 
Proverbs 18, 18, or 20, 21, a man's belly shall be satisfied with the fruit of his mouth and with the increase of his lips shall he be filled. Death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that lose Love it. Should eat the fruit thereof. You're eating the fruit of what comes out of your tongue. Proverbs 18, 20, 21. It's interesting. Paul used it in Romans 10, talking about confessing Christ. But in Deuteronomy 30, starting with verse 14, it says, But the word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. See, I have set before thee life and good, death and evil. Therefore choose, 30, verses 14, 15, and 19, Therefore choose life but the, that both thou and thy seed may live. It has to do with our words. The word is in you. Let's begin to speak proper words that produce life. Then the filling of the Spirit. Hallelujah. I don't have time to get into it all. But if we could yield our tongue to the Spirit, that may be the first step in changing the course of our lives. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, ability proper, prompted their speech. Oh, let's yield our tongue to the Holy Spirit again. And then yield, continue to yield in, in the things of this life and what we say in this life, even in our, in our known language. It's interesting. As we begin to speak, the Spirit begins to flow. Twice the children of Israel in Numbers were complaining about not having any water. The first time God told Moses to take his staff and smite the rock. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians 10 that that rock in the wilderness was Christ. And water came gushing out. The next time, sometime down the road, they begin to complain again. And Moses got angry and smote the rock when God said to speak to it. Now hear me. Christ was struck on Calvary's cross to release his spirit into our lives. If any man have not the spirit of Christ, he is none of his, Romans 8, 9. But then all we have to do to cause that water just gush out of us, those rivers of living water, is to begin to speak. They all spoke. Say, well, what if it's not me? It isn't. It ain't you. Or it is. It is you. I'm sorry. It is you. Paul said, I will pray with my spirit and I will pray with my understanding. I will sing with my spirit and I will sing with my understanding. It's your human spirit moved on by the spirit of God. Then victory. Revelation 12, 11, They overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. Every time you give testimony to what Jesus did for you in Calvary or you share the word with someone, you're bringing a death blow to the powers of darkness. Right now, I'm bringing a death blow to the powers of darkness by proclaiming God's word. And you, know, you can actually frame your world by the word you speak. By speaking his word. Job twenty two twenty eight, 28. Thou shalt also decree a thing and it shall be established unto thee and the light shall shine upon thy ways. Hebrews 11, 3 says, By faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which were seen which are seen, were not made out of the things which are visible. God spoke the worlds into existence, something that wasn't even. And when we begin to speak God's word, we can actually begin to frame our worlds and change the direction of our lives. 
Then edification. Versus destruction. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. Oh, let's begin to speak those things. Renew our mind. Let God fill us with the Spirit of God so that we begin to speak things that are filled with grace and favor, that are uplifting, and not things that beat down. Then unity. Let's speak the things that produce unity. The Corinthian believers were saying, I'm a Paul, I'm a Silas, I baptized, I was baptized by, by uh, Peter and Cephas and all this stuff. And they were arguing and having disputes who, 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 got, who got the best. Paul said, is Christ divided? He said, now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same things and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same of mind and in the same judgment. That's why it's important you have laid out what you believe as a church, that you teach the form of sound words, but you speak those things which become sound doctrine and lay out your vision, pastor, Write the vision and make it plain upon tablets that he may run that reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and it will not lie. It hastens to the goal. It will not fail. Though it tarry, wait for it because it will surely come. It will not delay. It will not tarry. Have a good two, two, and three. Write it out so you can all begin to speak the thing, same things and produce unity instead of discord, edification, Instead of destruction, build up instead of tear down. I want to share these two verses once again. Proverbs 64 3. They sharpen their tongues like swords and aim cruel words like deadly arrows. Too often, that's the badge that the church carries. Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords. Let's stop being re reckless with our words. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. Oh, let's let healing begin to flow from our tongues again. Healing within the body of Christ. Bringing unity, edification, encouragement. Instead of discord, in Jesus' name. Now let's pray. Father God, I pray right now in the name of Jesus that you would help us to bring our tongues under control of your spirit. Fill us anew with your spirit. We confess that we've all too often, God, every one of us have let deadly arrows and swords, as it were, flow from our mouth and pierce people's spirits and hearts, causing irreparable damage often, and even destruction within the body of Christ. Help us to start speaking those things that produce life. Let life begin to flow from our lips and our tongues, and no longer death. Change this deadly, empty, stench-filled sepulcher of our heart and make it like unto your heart. Give us that heart of flesh that you promised that we might speak words of life in Jesus' name. Amen.